microphone check. One, two, the microphone check. One, two, one, two, the microphone check. I got my headphones tuned between two different AM stations and my briefcase is full of declassified information. Declassified, uh huh, mm -hmm. declassified. Good evening and welcome to News from Neptune for the eighth week of 2015. For almost 25 years, this program has been a spontaneous and unrehearsed discussion of the news of the week and its coverage by the media. First on a so called community radio station. And when censored and locked out of there, welcomed, I'm happy to say, by the good people at Urbana Public Television. I'm Carl Estabrook. Our program's name, News from Neptune, was chosen to honor Noam Chomsky, who's been talking sense about American politics for more than twice the quarter century we've been on the air. Chomsky has said that the American media either repeat the same conventional doctrines everybody is saying, or else you say something true, and it will sound like it's from Neptune. This and previous editions of this program are archived on YouTube and posted to the Facebook page for News from Neptune, where you'll also find comments from viewers, articles we've referred to, and further comments from us. I also can be reached at carl at newsfromneptune.com, and I'm happy to receive your comments. It's the Lunar New Year, the Chinese Spring Festival for the Year of the Goat. Yang, uh, close as I come to the Chinese word for goat, is a component of the written Chinese character that means auspiciousness. Chinese is redolent of puns, and I'm told that the two were interchangeable in ancient Chinese. It's also a part of the character that counts kindness and benevolence as among its meanings. So, a happy year of the goat to us all. Unfortunately, kindness and benevolence is not what we see from the government for which we are supposedly responsible in the new year. This, is, of course, is the government that for the last 50 years has killed, wounded, and made homeless well over 20 million human beings, mostly civilians, not to protect freedom, as they say, but to secure the profits of the 1%. The Obama administration continues to do so today in Ukraine, Iraq, Syria, and Palestine while backing immiseration from Venezuela to Greece, Iran, and Russia, and employing the machinations of its principal thugs, the governments of Saudi Arabia and Israel, to accomplish those ends. You're watching News from Neptune, where our format is to take turns suggesting stories that have been ignored or misreported, sometimes, if not often, even innocently, in the corporate media, and then asking our colleagues to comment on them. And Ron Zoak has the first story. Well, <clears throat> I was going to mention first the uh, arrival of the lunar or Chinese or Buddhist New Year. And uh, apparently, as you say, the symbol for it is ambiguous. It means not only goat, uh, but sheep, and <laughs> ram. And it reminds me of our <clears throat> friend uh, uh, characterization of so much of the American populace and the electorate as sheeple, uh, <laughs> being uh, willing to be led almost anywhere by certain um, propagandists and pundits and so on, it appears. So that reminds me again of Milton's line, the sheep look up and are not fed, <laughs> and uh, we have no uh, public uh, <clears throat> philosophy uh, to promote uh, morale and constructive behavior it seems, and uh, uh, <clears throat> it's been noted many times before uh, by many people, uh, going back at least to Walter Lippmann and uh, others, but uh, uh, some would say we, uh, we need none, and uh, we just have to stick with the invisible hand and every man for himself, and uh, uh, that's all we need. That will redound to the benefit of society as a whole. So, uh, uh, more and more people, especially on the right, are predicting uh, eminent catastrophe and uh, collapse. This is a staple of uh, right-wing uh, columns. Uh, economic collapse is uh, imminent, and uh, disaster is uh, just ahead of us. Uh, more and more, we're hearing about uh, the horse race, which I think is a big waste of time and attention, but uh, anyway, uh, 
the potential Republican candidates are being asked to uh, take a stand on creationism versus Darwinism and uh, whether uh, Obama uh, loves America. Uh, what do you think, uh, Carl? Does, <laughs> does Obama love America or not? Uh, yeah, I'd kind of like to <laughs> work on getting his goat, so to speak. Yeah, yeah, but, uh, yeah. you know, his love uh, uh, doesn't concern me quite so much. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, from others, we're hearing that uh, David Green is kissing up to the anti Semitic left, uh, a uh, letter in the local newspaper. Yeah. Um, what do you say about that, I, David? I never, I never do it while, while I'm wearing lips, lipstick. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I, don't want, I don't want to leave any traces. Oh, okay. Okay, <laughs> well. Uh, we can move on to some yes. more serious uh, thoughts about <laughs> the state budget and uh, the cuts in higher education funding in Illinois and uh, Wisconsin a little later. So if you want to return to that. Thank you, sir. Uh, I neglected to mention at the top of the hour that uh, my discussions tonight are Ron Zoak and David Green, uh, but apparently the uh, uh, local uh, daily has been mentioning David too. So it's, uh, yeah. Well, I mean, there, there's um, you know, it's hard when you when you don't actually have an argument and you're not using facts. All you can do <laughs> is sort of attack people. And right. uh, the letter that was recently in the paper. Uh, from a man who claimed that he didn't want didn't want to debate me or doesn't want to, to you know, debate me about the Israel Palestine conflict, uh, but th that uh, that would be useless. And of course, that's something that I've been calling for, and uh, and expect certainly ha have not been surprised in receiving no response except negative ones from that because it's it's a it's an issue which the the truth of the matter is really very clear, so therefore we can't talk about it. He says, I, for one, would not want to be involved in any charade in which Green had a hand. <laughs> <laughs> so making, we can't come to your house and play charades. He's huh? making a lot of assumptions there about right. what, right. What, the, what the event would actually be like. And, and, um, this is a fellow, uh, I think he was a retired math, math professor named I.D. Berg, who yeah. oh, yes. has uh -huh. taken many opportunities over the years to vent uh, at my expense and so therefore I think in fact it truly he, does not bother me in various letters over the years he's mentioned each of us or, uh, uh, that's, for, that's, in one connection or another so yeah that's why so it's nice to, nice to hear from our fans we appreciate uh, yeah, that and yeah. uh, if you have comments uh, hey put them on our Facebook page uh, we'll uh, at least uh, we'll have at least as much fun with that as we will with this <laughs> yeah. um, I think I'd like to, you know I'd like to pick up on the the, the you know the the Bruce Rahner week week in week in review. It's been a, a big <laughs> week for, for uh, um, you know the budget and the whole thing and the whole the whole charade that's going on in yeah, yeah. In, in Springfield. And I just want to remind people there was actually uh, Jesse Jackson of all people actually had a nice column on Counterpunch reviewing these matters with a link to a, a website which details the nature of the Illinois state and local tax system. And uh, I, I looked at these figures and was was reminded of the simple fact that the top 20% uh, pay uh, a, pay an average of about 7% of their income in state and local taxes, whereas the bottom 20% pay about 13%. So when we're talking about the state budget, and sorry, you know, to use so many numbers and so many figures, but it's important to use these figures and also to place them in context. Uh, we're talking about uh, the gap in a, a 32 from a 32 to a 37 billion operating budget in this state for our schools and so forth. We're talking about five billion dollars in a state with a, with a GDP with a gross product of, of 750 billion dollars. And if you look at these figures on this particular website, you'll see that the income of the top 20 percent. Uh, if you do, if you calculate it and figure it out, and get a nice little spreadsheet going, like I like doing, uh, you'll find out that top 20% has an income of about 250 billion dollars, of which they're paying about 3% in state income tax. So that's you know 1% of 250 billion dollars being 2.5 billion dollars. So if you want to make up that 5 billion dollars, which 
we're getting emails about from Robert. Those of us who are still still employed uh, are are getting emails from Robert uh, Easter and Phyllis Wise about how we'll do the best we can. We're talking about a total of five billion dollars. We're talking about two percent of the income of the top twenty percent in our state, whose incomes average over two hundred thousand dollars. So these problems are simply easily solved. Our state isn't broke. There's no. just no way that our state is broke. We are one of the richest. We remain one of the richest states in the, the country. Our our per capita GDP in the state it ranks uh, 16th or 17th out of the 50 states. Uh, you know, comparable to states like like Pennsylvania and Wisconsin and Mi Mi Minnesota and, and and states like that. So um, all of uh, many of these other states have uh, you know. I think you know Minnesota is a particularly good good example of that. Um, have have budgets that provide for the needs of their people because they have tax systems that provide for those needs. You know, it was an interesting contrast uh, published recently between what's been going on in Wisconsin and Minnesota, and uh, the disaster that seems to be overtaking uh, Wisconsin uh, on the watch of. Uh, uh, the governor there. Scott Walker. Uh -huh. Scott Walker, yeah. Right. Um, uh, this uh, is an article by... Uh, uh, just to, uh, to follow that point up, um, uh, Ron, uh, the sure. uh, Wisconsin and Minnesota, uh, there have also been a, com a couple of interesting uh, articles recently on um, Minneapolis as, a, uh, uh, as an example of uh, urban finance and that what uh, Minnesota has managed to do with its principal city as opposed to the difficulties uh, in many other places and we don't even have to mention Detroit um, and these are all a result of policy these are not uh, sort of a, a result of the weather uh, except when it is uh, and the uh, uh, example of what some states can do in these matters uh, is worth discussing and uh, uh, pointing out over against this mythological account of uh, uh, of greedy unions and whatnot that we get from um, uh, from Wisconsin, um, there's a parallel. Uh, there was a parallel example in the news this week about the uh, remarkable success of the state of Utah in dealing with homelessness, uh, and the way they've done it is in fact a fr at a fraction of the cost that other states uh, spend to fail to do it. Uh, so this, uh, this is a, a real political argument that we're having, that we should be having here, about how state finances and municipal finances are run, and not an argument about uh, the ideological notions of uh, uh, how the, uh, uh, the poor aren't pulling their weight and therefore need to be taxed more. I have here an article that was in Inside Illinois uh, by Walt McMahon, who's a kind of acquaintance of mine. I don't know him very well. He's a retired economics professor at uh, the university. <clears throat> he, uh, he says that in-state tuition and fees at public institutions in Illinois are now the fourth highest in the nation. An Illinois share of state support for its community colleges is 49th in the nation, uh, which is not looking good. So the uh, article goes on to ask, what does the underfunding of higher education portend for the state of Illinois? Do we need to start thinking of education funding as an investment in human capital mm. rather than as a line item expenditure. And I think that's the fundamental fallacy because every time uh, this comes up, we start hearing from uh, some people that uh, this is all spending, spending, spending. And uh, they refuse to make a distinction between spending and investment. Uh, I think that's, that's fundamental. Capital expenditures are uh, quite different from uh, current operating expenditures. Right, And there is no reason in the world, there's no financial or economic reason why uh, higher education in this country couldn't be completely free. Uh, the idea that that's uh, out of the question is um, contradicted by the experience of many other countries. Uh, in Germany, uh, as a result of agreements between uh, the lender and the, and the central government between the, what we would see as the state and federal uh, levels, um, all, all uh, 
uh, college tuition has recently been free and uh, has recently been made uh, free. Uh, and that's been the case for a while in Finland, Denmark, and places like that. Um, the, uh, uh, in fact, it's been pointed out the Danish government says uh, 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 not only is tuition free, but the government will provide $900 a month for living expenses for six years for those who attend Danish higher institutions of higher education. And Denmark has one of the highest standards of living even in Europe. So, uh, But in this country, I mean, such notions are just, they're not even part of the discussion. Right. Uh, but that's what the rest of the world is doing. And the arguments for it in the rest of the world is usually what you suggest, Ron, that the, uh, that this is a, an investment in human capital for the, for the society as a whole, not just a, um, a, a, a a career uh, boost for individuals, which it clearly is. Yeah. At a fundamental level, what we need to understand, I think, is that only that in given the way capitalism works, given the way that capitalism goes through regular, not only regular cyclical downturns, but blows up bubbles and then explodes them, the only way that that you can have a reasonably consistent economy is through government spending on a regular basis and especially to adapt to things like that. I mean, things like, things like the real estate bubble simply shouldn't have happened at all. But once they do happen, you need the government to spend that money because the private sector won't spend that money. When the people don't have the money in their pockets to spend, the private sector isn't going, going to invest that money um, b before it's in the hands of workers. So only the government can do that. And so the assumption that we read every day that somehow the govern that government spending is the problem, it's government spending that's, that's making it difficult for the private sector to revitalize our you know, <laughs> you know, economy is, is just simply backwards. What uh, yeah. um, recently been called uh, uh, economic creationism, Right. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. a, a mythology that stands in the way of understanding what that what a, what actually is going on. Mm -hmm. The point you make, David, is the conclusion that everyone came to, often connected with the name of John Maynard Keynes, but mm -hmm. the, uh, uh, the 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 conclusion of the. Uh, uh, economics of the first half of the 20th century. I mean, there are no mysteries here. This is not uh, uh, no. arcana. Uh, no. This is obvious. Yeah. Um, Paul Krugman has an interesting column on this this morning uh, about uh, the uh, charlatans and cranks who keep coming up with this, what apparently is uh, sacred doctrine on the right, that if you cut taxes, this will increase economic activity so much that uh, government revenue will actually increase. And it's been shown to be wrong in Kansas, in Louisiana, uh, but no, no matter how many times mm -hmm. it's uh, uh, shown to be wrong and discredited and so on, they keep coming back to it. Yeah. So we, we see this doctrine being challenged in, in Greece right now. Yeah. And, you know, the, 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 the doctrine that somehow, uh, you know, austerity is, the, you know, the answer. So hopefully what, you know, that people will understand what, I mean, depending on what happens in Greece, people will come to understand what needs to be done. Um, and in a sense, at the state level in this country, we're kind of like Greece because we don't, we don't create, we don't print our own currency, right. we don't issue our own currency. So Greece has to address the problems of being in the Euro and in the European Union, uh, uh, which are two different things, but still, yeah. uh, uh, that, that they're, um, there are things that can be done even in that context. And we do need to talk about the federal government and the role of currency at that level, as, as, as I've been trying to do for the last few months on this, on this program. But there's still things that can be, can be done at the state level in terms of the, the tax structure and the, and, you know, the tax and spending structure, which, which, um, which can't be done from the perspective of the 1% because they would have to admit about the way the system is really working. I really don't know what goes on in the head of people like Bruce Rahner. On the, on the one hand, he's smart enough to become an extremely wealthy man. But on, 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 but on, the, on the other hand, he has to believe in a system. I'm, I'm sure that he, he believes what he's saying. But what he's saying is a completely inaccurate understanding of how our state economy and, and how, how our government works. 
Well, Ron often <laughs> cautions us on this program against uh, mm -hmm. going into the minds of the people whose politics we're criticizing, and I certainly would do that for our current governor. Uh, I certainly would agree with Ron on that point mm -hmm. in regard to our current gov governor, what he actually thinks in his heart of hearts, uh, what, uh, what he's giving up for Lent. Uh, this I'm not sure about at all. Mm -hmm. But I am sure that what we've had for a generation more in this country is an absolutely cynical uh, presentation of economic ideas from the people who um, uh, will profit a great deal from convincing their fellow citizens that those ideas are, are right. They know those ideas are wrong. They know that austerity doesn't work. They know that the neoliberal doctrines of decreasing public social services uh, and um, uh, decreasing uh, public spending in the way that you just described, that those things will actually be harmful to a majority of the, uh, of the society but they don't care because those things will be profitable to the 1%. Uh, it's not, not that they're deluded, deluded, not that they need to wake up one morning and say, oh, gee, we've been wrong about that. We really thought this was going to help everybody, mm -hmm. and it's not. That's not that, so, so do you that think I'm willing to suggest is not the case. So is it only, is it only journalists and pr pr you know, professors who believe what politicians are saying? Well, that's you know something to that. Whose line is it... Um, uh, uh, I think it goes back to Karl Kraus, who said that the r biggest problem with political propaganda was that um, politicians lie to the newspapers and then believe what they read in the papers. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I think that's, that, that's a, that closed circle is a good, pretty good example of, the, of neoliberal eco economics uh, that has been sold to us by people like, uh, by, uh, people like the governor of Illinois and the governor of Wisconsin. I think a lot of people don't realize how destructive it is to uh, underfund education. And uh, McMahon's estimates uh, for what happens when you take one dollar away from uh, uh, education, it's not clear whether it's higher education or lower education. Uh, uh, the return for each state dollar invested is currently 15.3% for two-year degrees and 14% for four-year degrees based on increments to earnings. It is twice that if the effects on health, child development, civic, civic institutions, crime, and other social benefits are included. Since the average funds, average cost of funds average about 7.2% over 10 years, higher education, he concludes, is a very good investment for the future of the state and its people. But uh, uh, all you can get people to talk about, I find, in, in many cases, is whether the politicians, uh, they don't understand all this stuff, they don't want to go into it. Uh, all they uh, think about is spending, 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 and whether the guy is, appears to be sincere. And uh, I don't... <laughs> Sincerity is no rated virtue, you yeah, say, right. right. <laughs> uh, I, uh, I don't uh, go for that at all. I don't give a damn if he's sincere or not. <laughs> I want to know if he's coming to the right conclusions. But, uh, uh, that seems to me to be uh, uh, a defensible position. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the, 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 there is a point here, though, that the, the, that the best lie is a partial truth. Mm. Uh, and we certainly have heard a lie about, uh, that is a partial truth, about uh, why wages are flat in this country and have been for 40 years. I mean, if you look at uh, uh, the... the, the family income and, and statistics of that sort. We have a long period from the end of the Second World War up to the, up to the 1970s in which um, uh, the, the, the rising tide lifted all boats, so, so to speak. That is, the immense wealth of the American 1% actually did in, involve the uh, increase in the, uh, uh, the, the, the national income for everyone percentage differentials applied, but nevertheless, that was happening. Uh, at the early 70s, with the neoliberal counterattack, uh, the, uh, that, that, uh, that stopped. Uh, and 
in the last 40 years, wages in this country for most Americans have been flat or declining. Now, uh, the explanation that was offered for that as it became clear what was happening uh, was lack of education. If you want a good job, get a good education. Uh, American workers you know, are, are falling behind in competitiveness with the rest of the world, it was said, and that was because they don't work hard enough to get education. Therefore, they should go to get education. Oh, by the way, they have to pay for that education. You know, it's not free as it is in Finland or Denmark or Germany, uh, but nevertheless, that's the problem. An interesting example of blaming the victim uh, that, in fact, had the, the half-truth in it that, that education is a, uh, a community good, as you say. Uh, it was a pretty good argument, a pretty good catch, that catch-22, and uh, there are still an awful lot of people who believe it. So you're justified in taking out a big student loan, right? Well, that's, that's, that's that what the they, line, right? That was the line, sure. And as a result, and that turned out to have all sorts of, uh, of, of benefits. The one that we had uh, occasion to mention recently was uh, the reason that there's um, no student peace movement in the wars in Southwest Asia as there were, was a student peace movement in the wars in Southeast Asia. Uh, the, it's a very different time economically. The 60s and 70s, or uh, the, the Vietnam War era, was an era of expansion for the Amer from the American economy, uh, and um, it was there, there were good times, so to speak. Um, it was uh, bound up, indeed, with the economy that produced the war. Uh, the current economy is very different, and the result is that you have students who are caught in a debt trap. Uh, they uh, borrowed all that money, they took out the student loans to go, to go to school, and they know perfectly well they have to get their degree to be able to uh, get the job that will allow them finally to pay back any of those loans. They're in the same position as Greece in some ways, and uh, for the, some of the same reasons. It's a, uh, a debt trap is a wonderful form of manipulation. Uh, I, I, th I think that we can justify educational spending from all the way from preschool through college at a massive level, just as it, a, a is a, hum, a sort of humanistic program. Exactly. Wh whatever the economic benefits are, which are sort of created by a kind of rigged system anyway about how yeah. economic benefits work in relationship to in relationship to to schooling. But beyond that, you could justify it just in terms of a jobs program for all the skilled people and want to be skilled people who are who would, could be working in schools and classrooms and in classrooms of smaller sizes all the way from, from grammar school through college. You can justify that as a jobs program to put money in the people, to put a decent wage in the hands of those people to get the, get the economy going. I mean, not that that's the only, the only reason, but you know, it's, it's, there's nothing wrong with seeing education or public spending as any kind, whether it's roads or libraries or anything else, as, as a jobs program, which is the foundation of our economy. That's what, again, what we have to get straight is that government spending isn't, isn't a kind of add-on. You don't have private yeah. spending first right. and then government spending. You have government spending first, and that's what makes the private sector, that's what you have government spending to create full full employment and then the private sector will do just will do just fine so, so that's just we've got the again we've got things backwards of course we'll naturally have all these things out and discuss this matter freely and openly in the society in the run up to the next presidential election mm -hmm. right where we'll have these two options posed to one another and we'll be able the, to talk about uh, it and the, decide. the new york times this morning i mean i don't read the newspaper i just look at the headlines there's an article about chris christie there's an article yeah. about jeb bush there's an article about hillary clinton it's mm -hmm. february 2015 last time i checked my calendar <laughs> okay w articles oh they don't want to cover they don't want to get such an early start on covering all these things that's what they're talking about and it won't make a damn bit of difference which of these three people or any other person ends up being president in January of, tw of uh, 2017. And we've suggested that the uh, situation, uh, the economic situation in the U.S. and the economic situation in the EU, in Europe, are, are not finally all that different, although there are certain differences of degree. Um, uh, what, what, what's what's the, the great moral drama around Greece going to mean? Uh, first of all, how do you think it's going to come out? And secondly, uh, what can we, what sort of parallels could we draw to what we'll be looking at uh, between now and our uh, uh, our, our 
quadrennial quadrille about the presidency. Yeah, well, people are going to get, get get the idea that there's you know politics could be an act, actually inter, interesting interesting thing that in a democratic country like Greece, people could vote for a genuinely leftist party that actually it, with really governed by really smart people who understand you know who do draw some lines and um, it, it's too soon to say at the end of this week. I meant to sort of yeah. update myself after the events of the last couple of days, but didn't really have, have, have a chance to. But things are, things are at a kind of precipice right now in terms of the relationship between Greece. They're kind of playing yep. a game of chicken, if, that's, if yep. that's the right word for it. And uh, I still have an enormous amount of faith, faith that Yanis Varoufakis, the Greece finance minister, and his cronies, that's not a good word to use. His com comrades <laughs> um, are are going. They to, don't want you to use are, that word are either. Going uh, to <laughs> do the right thing, and so I mean, it's kind of ironic. We taught, we mentioned Germany in the context of the kind of welfare state that you just referred to in terms of higher ed, Carl. But Germany is um, exercising a tyrannical force over the the eurozone, yep. and. That just has to be stopped, and it relates. Again, it's that's ironic in the context of European leaders being a relatively moderate for moderating force uh, in relationship to um, the U.S. trying to gin up World War III mm -hmm. with Russia. So there's a lot of really complicated things going on now within countries, within Europe, within Europe and and Asia. The the Middle East, so it just takes a lot of of adaptation to understand how all these things relate to each other. It looks like Germany is going to manage to break Syriza right now. Syriza is the Greek party, the insurgent Greek party that won the election and uh, uh, insisted that it would rework the economic relationship between Greece and the European Union. Uh, they look like losing right now. Uh, Germany looks like it has the upper hand. Germany, uh -huh. in this case, the German government, as it's uh, uh, represented through the Troika, as they say, mm -hmm. uh, the the uh, uh, International Monetary Fund, the EU, and the um, uh, European, um, uh, what's the central administration called? I forget. Yeah. In any case, those three. Uh, and right now, they have the upper hand over Greece, and the papers suggest that uh, Syriza is not going to be able to find a way to um, uh, uh, stand against uh, the demands on the Greek economy being, being made by uh, by the European Union. Um, so yes, it's it's disturbing, and uh, one can only think that uh, what we're talk looking at here is not a uh, uh, an isolated fight, but a good indication of the general uh, situation we find ourselves in, including here in the United States. Germany appears to be on the side of the big investors who what are a surprise. demanding <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. prompt payment. Yeah. And uh, Greece is trying to get an extension of the terms. I mean, they're not repudiating the debts entirely. Not yet, anyway. And so it's, we'll see. It's been discussed that, that, uh, that Greece should look for support or aid from uh, Russia and China uh, yes. from the Eurasian economy in some way, and that raises all sorts of other questions, including the other side of the uh, uh, of, of the double track that uh, David just referred to, uh, and that is the fact that Germany and France together have been um, doing their best to undercut uh, this mad American attempt to, uh, simply to uh, force a war with Russia. I mean, the Obama administration is hardly to be believed, but the Obama administration's activities, uh, uh, pr pr particularly in regard to Ukraine, uh, have been nothing less than a uh, provocation to war, an attempt at regime change in Russia, because it's an attempt to understand the, uh, to undermine um, the Russian economy and the Russian economy as part of the general Eurasian economy. Uh, I think if you had described uh, to the most um, uh, uh, skeptical American politician, uh, skeptical American pundit about uh, the 
uh, Obama administration over a year ago that the Obama administration would do something like this that would produce a war that has already cost at least 5,000 lives in eastern Ukraine, and they would do it with a cynicism and a um, uh, contempt for uh, international politics uh, that's been displayed by the United States since the uh, uh, Maidan uh, insurrection began in Ukraine, they wouldn't have believed you. They wouldn't have thought that the U.S. would be so cruel and so mad uh, to do something quite so dangerous. But that's what they're doing, and it's only in this case as David suggested, uh, the intervention of the otherwise rather weak-kneed European authorities uh, in the French and German government that's uh, even put a stop to it, for, uh, even put a, a partial halt to it for the moment, and the story is by no means over. It's astonishing. Comments on the Ukraine, gentlemen? Well, no, I see a uh, uh, ever bigger crisis uh, building there, and if uh, the U.S. gets involved in sending heavy weapons to the uh, Ukrainians. Uh, where, where does it stop? I mean, will it escalate? We don't know. Again, the fundamental fallacy is that wars can be contained and uh, limited and turned on and off at will and so on. And, uh, it's just wrong. It's, it's false. And... Uh, uh, I think I see immense danger there. No, we see nor we see continued effort to in the mainstream media. The New York Times this morning, uh, an article by Peter Baker and one other person, who is their sort of national correspondent or presidential correspondent. Obama has a meeting about human rights, and a bunch of people are there. A bunch of people from different countries are there, including Egypt. And the writer, Peter Baker, is, is, is the, the tone of the article is that Obama pr professes human rights, but he's professing it to people who have a problem with human rights. <laughs> so we're supposed to believe that Obama himself doesn't have a problem with human rights. This continued effort to reinforce the, the notion that somehow America is fundamentally good in our flagship liberal newspaper. Yeah. Um, after all these years, after 70 years since World War II of, of the United States supporting dictatorships, including Egypt, who violate human rights as an ongoing, as an ongoing matter. Um, it just, it's hard to, again, I have to, it's hard to, does this journalist believe this? Does he <laughs> believe what he's writing? And how are we, how is it that we're supposed, you know, there's there's an element of seriousness in the New York Times that we're supposed to take that we don't have when we watch Fox News. But what's the difference? What's the difference? Well, and it's a, a mark of Noam Chomsky is that the best way to control a debate is to um, set the limits of the allowable debate quite clearly, but within that have two contrasting parties who will enact a, an argument for you. And you can get very excited about the argument, you know, the, the Democrats and Republicans, the, what we call laughingly in this country, the left and the right, arguing about these things, because that reinforces rather than challenges the limits of that, of, of, of that debate. Uh, I think we see a great example of that in regard to this immensely dangerous uh, activity of the U.S. government in regard to, in regard to Russia. Uh, there's a note here that there are increasing signs that Merkel, the German Chancellor, and Hollande, the French president, operated behind the backs of the Americans when they traveled to Minsk last week in an attempt to reach an agreement between the warring factions in Ukraine. During a closed-door meeting at the Munich Security Summit, Victoria Nuland, who has been the uh, uh, point person, so to speak, pointing-headed person, uh, most involved in this, the American State Department, fumed that the Europeans needed to be fought. Der Spiegel, the German news magazine, described a closed-door meeting, apparently reported on anonymously both to it and to the Bild newspaper, held by Assistant Secretary of State Newland at the Munich Security Conference, with perhaps two dozen U.S. diplomats and senators. There, Newland gave instructions to, quote, fight against the Europeans, 
on the issue of arming Ukraine to fight Russia. The point here is that the idea that there's some sort of debate in the U.S. between neocons and liberals or whatever in the uh, Obama administration is simply false. The American position is consistent through both administrations and even enacted by the same person, Victoria Nuland. She was described as bitterly referring to the German chancellors and French presidents meeting with Russian President Putin as, quote, Merkel's Moscow junk and Moscow bull. And she welcomed the senators, they don't say which one, I meant to find out, uh, an American senator, uh, calling German Defense Minister Ursula von Leyen the defeatism minister. Uh, the commentator uh, says that we guess that defeatism minister has replaced cheese-eating surrender monkey in the locution of, uh, 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 of American journalists to describe Europeans who are not too much interested in fighting a nuclear war in Europe for America's economic interests. Uh, uh, the, um, this the account, these leaked uh, accounts of what the U.S. is actually doing in regard to promoting war in Ukraine and uh, the uh, destruction of the Russian economy um, uh, are appearing, of course, in the, uh, uh, in the European press in some small parts of it, not generally, and certainly not in the BBC and not in the English language media, uh, where what we get is, as Ron says frequently, Russian aggression, Russian aggression, Russian aggression. And uh, it's, uh, you know, it's clear that the aggression is uh, Victoria Nuland aggression, Victoria Nuland aggression. Uh, but that's not the story you'll hear in the American media. You're listening to News from Neptune. Uh, we have a few minutes left here. What other stories should we turn our attention to, gentlemen? Just one note uh, related to what uh, David was saying particularly. Uh, there's a demand now in some quarters to make higher education uh, more practical and <laughs> to teach yeah. people uh, saleable skills and so on. This is becoming a prominent part of what Walker is saying in Wisconsin, apparently. Uh, saleable skills. Yeah, and uh, what's going to happen to join the army? Uh, the uh, great University of Wisconsin at Madison, if uh, they really attempt to carry uh, through on that. So this involves a standard fallacy about higher education and the internal conflict between uh, vocationalism and uh, what we might call um, more general or cultural. Uh, education. And the, the policy there is that what, when people are taught so-called practical skills, job skills, uh, those are quickly obsolete. Yes. And uh, most people are not doing uh, what they were trained for in their major in college anyway. Uh, they've had three or four or five jobs uh, since then on, in various uh, areas. But uh, we're seeing again the uh, uh, advocacy of so-called practical meaning education meaning what will make money for you in in the uh, short run and uh, it's so self-defeating uh, it's ridiculous but uh, don't get me started on that. In, my, in my dotage I uh, find myself thinking a lot about uh, my own education uh, after spending the better part of 40 years supposedly contribute to, uh, contributing to other people's educations in uh, uh, universities and university systems and uh, as I say in retirement my view is that uh, uh, it was ill-conceived from the beginning every time we moved away from uh, what uh, I give them credit where it's due, conservatives referred to as great books programs. All the things that I taught, uh, the, the, the courses and so forth that I taught, um, would have been uh, uh, improved uh, had we taken the sort of old-fashioned notion of attending to the best that had been thought and said on a given subject, uh, rather than reading textbooks or uh, uh, Worse yet, training, training, training for uh, you know some available job in the way that you describe. Yeah, right? the Matthew Arnold uh, idea, which I think I, is still very valid. I think it's right. I I wouldn't have said so in the middle of my teaching career, but I do say so now. Yeah. I think that's exactly right. I think you know I went to a meeting at the campus YMCA last week 
or a, a talk that was given by a guy named John K. Wilson, uh, who writes on the Academe blog and has been writing about a lot about the you know, Salada case. And very well, and, too. Yeah, right. And, and he spoke as well as, uh, actually, it was a paper by Michael Rothberg, who wasn't there because his wife had twins. And, <laughs> and it was read by a woman named Harriet Murov. Um, and in, in any event, um, it got to the point in this meeting where faculty members started talking about the only recourse to, 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 to address this uh, violation of, 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 of academic freedom, and, and especially in terms of hiring and so forth, was for them to go on, on a strike and for them to really plan this. I don't know what's happened in the week and a half since then. Um, I mean, my idea is that the only the only way this is really going to come to a head, I mean, whether it's um, <clears throat> whether it's Greece or whether it's faculty members here, the point is, do you have an exit option and are you willing to <laughs> use it? Are you willing to go on strike? Uh -huh. Are you willing to leave the euro? You know, that's the the point where power and powerlessness come comes to a head. And and and, and, and I guess I mean the the one thing I would say about you know, the whole liberal arts thing on this campus. And of course, a good prestigious campus has good liberal arts programs, and people like to be proud of their faculty members. But they just, but at the same time, there's a stereotype that they're a bunch of raving leftists and so forth, which <laughs> isn't really true. But it is some of the genuine leftists who have really come to the fore in this, in this local conflict. But the question, the question becomes, in Margaret Thatcher's language, is there, to modify your language, is there an alternative to the neoliberal campus in, in the whole institutional structure of the way business is done here from the, from the state on down in terms of the budgets, in terms of, of, the, of the research money? Is there really any meaningful alternative in, in, uh, beyond just the ideas that some people can still speak, the truth that some people can still speak? Um, uh, important as that is, what effect can that possibly have on a campus in which is governed by these increasingly iron, iron laws of ne neo ne neoliberal, ne you know, this ne neoliberal necessity? To Remember take, Tina? Tina. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. To take one example or or one aspect of the parallel you suggest, uh, David, a uh, parallel between the Greek situation and the situation on, uh, of academics and a campus uh, in the American University. Uh, in both cases, I, I think you're right to suggest that we're looking at uh, sort of neoliberal neoliberal policies. Um, uh, being imposed upon uh, pre-existing institutions. Uh, the neoliberal policies, though, in both cases um, uh, may, in fact, not be best uh, opposed by a strike. Uh, there are those who say, for example, that uh, uh, the EU really wants to force Greece out of the euro uh, as a way of disciplining the uh, system as a whole, uh, that the Grexit that they're talking about, the Greek exit mm -hmm. from the euro, is exactly what the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the fin financiers in Germany uh, have in mind, uh, what they're trying to, um, uh, trying to force uh, the Syriza to, into, into doing. Uh, a, an academic strike uh, against an egregious violation of academic freedom, such as we've witnessed here at the University of Illinois in the last uh, in the last several months, um, might have, uh, from the point of view of uh, the administrators of the neoliberal university, the same beneficial effect. Uh, hey, let them go on strike. We'll fire them too, and we'll get these troublemakers out of the university. The American university system has been remarkably successful in getting rid of troublemakers, particularly troublemakers who shelter under uh, those, those uh, presumed canons of academic freedom uh, from very early on, back to the First World War, all through Vietnam and so forth. Um, uh, American universities have been very good about uh, taking on academic strikes as an occasion to get uh, dangerous people off campus. Uh, dangerous people being those who criticize the functioning of the neoliberal university. Think that's a danger here? 
<laughs> I don't know. I thought of a scheme, actually, that would be a slight extension of what's going on anyway, whereas people could uh, pledge a certain amounts of money to the administration if uh, they would fire certain professors who are saying things that they don't like. Do sort of a slave auction in right, reverse. Right, right, right. Uh -huh. So you want to get rid of Professor X who's saying things hey, that you I'll don't put like? Up, I'll put up $100 to that. <laughs> right. Yeah, right. Sure. Fire him, too. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I don't I mean I just I don't put anything past the the governor the governor uh, Phyllis Wise the whole I mean they, they just there's this very cold blooded attitude about going the way they go about their business of enforcing this sort of neoliberal model and again what's the alternative even if you hire even if you hired Salida even if you win a court case right. um, the, what is it that's what is it that's happening on this campus. I mean, it's true that some students are still exposed to ideas that would cause them to question the system and, and to perhaps, I mean, uh, you know, the, the, the graduate students especially uh, are, you know, are, are still, you know, imbued with those notions that they're, that they're fighting, that they're fighting for something, for, for some kind of so, social justice. That has been partly undermined, as you've mentioned, Har Carl, uh, a million times on this program <laughs> by identity politics and the mm -hmm. manner in which that works. Mm -hmm. And that continues to go on in terms of a couple other meetings that I've I've been to. And and um, but the the you know it, it just it's it's hard to see where where the room is where the room is for anything other than freedom, you know, perhaps some minor victories in terms of freedom of of speech that will have no effect on this juggernaut, this sort of neoliberal juggernaut, as it, as it kind of um, uh, effectively silences any kind of radical voices in terms of genuine social change. Well, I'm afraid well, you're right. Yeah, in part it's uh, thinking we can turn education over to the industrial engineers. And uh, we measures of inputs and outputs, and we get the measures of uh, outputs by giving lots of tests yeah. and so on, and looking at the uh, salaries of uh, graduates and so on. But uh, I think uh, all of that is a uh, terrible disservice to uh, the idea of education. Yeah. An old uh, thesis of mine is that if people knew what education really was, they would uh, be against it. They would well, forbid would, it and try to outlaw it. Well, that's well, what they but, told but, it. That's what they told the guy with a cup of hemlock, right? right. right. Yeah. I mean, yeah. uh, but I, but what what I would ask you, Carl, in terms of reading the the great books, I mean, I mean anybody can read the great books. The question is, what's the? I mean, I, I struggle with the idea of education, quote unquote, for its own sake. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I mean. There, there is a you, you know utilitarian aspect in the most radical sense, and um, and um, I I don't I you know I would I would like I would like to see the great books read and acted upon in mm -hmm. so far as they as they lead us to an understanding of a society in which people are truly equals seen yeah. as equals. Yeah, yeah. I, it sound, sounds. Very close to the ideals of uh, uh, of American society, um, and uh, ideals that, of course, are observed in the breach uh, uh, all the time. Um, it's been pointed out that the, the the coming of modern society depended upon uh, the. Uh, evocation of some of these universal ideas, uh, education, democracy, freedom, and so forth, precisely because the class that established modern society, the bourgeoisie, as the old man in the British Museum called it, uh, the owners of capital, the owners of capital uh, were all too small a class to rule by themselves. Uh, they needed allies, and the way they got allies was by saying, we're doing this for everybody. Universalism, mm -hmm. and that's what we get, you know, in from the Declaration of Independence to the French Revolution's Declaration uh, of the uh, of the Rights of Man, etc. Uh, the, the idea is that these uh, this is being done for society as a whole. Now, the problem with that is that it's not being done for society as a whole, but it's being done by a self-interested hey, class. what's good for General Motors is good for the U.S. Well, there we are. There we are. <laughs> uh, but as uh, 
Carl Hess, the old, uh, the, the late anarchist, who I find myself quoting various times these days, used to say, sometimes the most revolutionary thing you can do is ask liberals to live up to their principles. And here are good liberal principles that we need to ask people, we, we need to ask the society to live up to, and just busily uh, avoiding doing so. Um, in our lifetimes, the example has been that uh, uh, the post-World War II era in America saw uh, these principles uh, enacted, however grudgingly, by the ruling class, the GI Bill and things like that, that were answers to people saying, what, what were we fighting for? What was that war about? Uh, and where's the society that we were promised uh, that would be, uh, that, that would, would win that war? Uh, that worked for a generation. But now for another generation beyond that, we've had the, uh, uh, the bourgeoisie saying, no, look, we're going to take it back. We gave away too many things in those days, social security and welfare and uh, uh, you, the a step towards universal education. We can't do that anymore because it's not making us enough money. Therefore, we're going to confiscate it. This is austerity. And this is a situation we find ourselves in, and it works in education as it works in the working life of most Americans all the time. But until we call things by their right names, do we see what's being done? It's harder to counter them. What we get is the sterile debate between Republicans and Democrats about public policy. Uh, and that debate has moved substantially to the right uh, in this generation. That's the triumph of neoliberalism. They're doing very nicely. Thank you. You've been watching News from Neptune for the eighth week of 2015, a Polar Vortex edition. I'm Carl Esterbrook. My discussants tonight have been David Green and Ron Zoke. Our thanks to our director and producer, Jason Liggett. Uh, upcoming programs here on UPTV include Labor's Worldview on Sunday at 4 p.m. with Neptuner David Johnson. And more news from outside the bubble, as Harry Shearer says, that you can't hear elsewhere in Champaign-Urbana. Inshallah, we'll be back next week with a new edition of News from Neptune to remind you in the words of Edward de Vere, what's past is prologue, what to come in yours and my discharge. In the meantime, confusion to our enemies and a good night to you. <laughs>